So as I started to find that middle way, that third way of you don't have to just try hard or give up. You can care about the things that matter to you, but then you can sort of let the other stuff go. And my life started to change. And then I was like, I want to tell other people about this. Welcome to the For the Love podcast with me, Jen Hatmaker. Today, we're talking about how to become lazy geniuses who work smarter, not harder with podcaster and author Kendra Adachi. Hey, everybody, Jen Hatmaker here, your host of the For the Love podcast. Welcome to the show. Oh, my. We're in a delightful series, and I am so happy about it. It's called For the Love of Small Wins, and it's just like what it's been doing for me is allowing me to do two things. Take a big, deep breath in, which is something like breathing is underrated. Like I can get a full breath and also exhale. It's just been nurturing and nourishing and timely. Okay, so today's guest, you're going to be delighted by. Like, please stay all the way to the end when we literally lose our minds over Hamilton. So it's time, this just, just buckle in for the next hour. So I wonder about this. Has there ever been a time when the phrase work smarter, not harder has ever applied more? It has not for me. And I think in my community, I know you too. I know that you are hustling to take care of yourself, your people, you're working hard at your job. You're trying desperately to put good things into the world. You're trying to keep your relationship strong and healthy. You are managing a pandemic. You're doing so much every single day. What you don't need anyone telling you to do is to do more and be more because you are already enough and you're doing enough. So Today, we are talking to someone who's going to help us turn the do more dial down a few notches. God bless her. Gosh, you're going to love this conversation, you guys. She's going to teach us how to score some small wins in a way that really appeals to me. Small little dial changes that make massive impact on the way we're able to move through our day. And this is what she calls it, the lazy genius way. (laughs) I'm so jealous that I did not come up with that. Kendra Adachi. That's our guest today. She's the founder of the Lazy Genius Collective. So Kendra is a very beloved podcaster. Tons of you already know her. And now she's the New York Times bestselling author of the brand new book, The Lazy Genius Way. Guys, it was an instant New York Times bestseller for good reason, because it's chock full of no frills advice and straight up good humor. And I, that's what I need. That's what I need. Not, do not be fussy with me. Do not be overly complicated and please make me laugh. That's what I need. We needed Kendra this year. So she invites us to live well by our own definitions, not some weird narrative, whatever that may be. So this book, The Lazy Genius Way is as warm and clever as Kendra herself. You'll see. And whatever you do, please don't skip the footnotes. Just trust me on this. I mean, let's be honest. Anyone who is known for a recipe called the Tim Riggins salad will be right at home here on the For the Love podcast. We enjoy talking to each other so much. I have takeaways that I'm going to immediately implement. And I think you will too. So I'm so pleased to share my conversation with the grand poobah of lazy geniuses, Kendra Adachi. Kendra, I'm so happy to meet you. I feel like now you're my new friend. Welcome to the For the Love podcast. Thank you for having me. I have been so excited to talk to you. I'm spin- Do you notice I'm spinning in my chair like a child? Like, I'm just, it's like, it's Jen. I'm so excited to talk to Jen. Oh. <laughs> I love it so much. Everybody listening. So when we popped on, we can see each other, but obviously for you, this is just audio, but Kendra looks absolutely darling. Like she looks like a grown person who showed up for work like a professional. I look like a college freshman who hasn't had a shower in five days. I don't have a bra on and I didn't disclose that to you, Kendra. But not and so we're kind of taking the 50-50 approach, everybody. Like Kendra's the cute one. Just know it in your brain and your visualization. And I'm in like a hoodie and glasses and a like atrocious top bun that I slept in. So anyway. I think you look great. I do. Oh, it's great. Nope. All the ways. We're all Uh, allowed. All the ways. Yeah, we are. And we're smart enough to have figured out how to work from home. And so if that means that we get to show up like this to our literal work day, well then, you know, that's a small win. So, okay. A ton of my listeners already know you, but for those who don't, I've told them a little bit about who you are. I kind of high leveled it for them. 
obviously you're well beloved for your famous change your life chicken as you should be giving us permission to nap without guilt. I'm a napper. So that alone is friendship material. I want to be a napper. What I should say is I could be, if I regularly built that into my life, I could fall asleep in the middle of the day. It's possible. I just wonder if you can roll it back a little bit for everybody. Tell us more about who you are, where you are coming from, and kind of your general path to becoming the lazy genius, which is the greatest moniker I've ever heard in my living life. (laughs) Thank you so much. Hey, by the way, before I tell you that, so I do nap every day. I take 17-minute naps. I know that sounds a little sociopathic, but if you set your timer on your phone, 17 minutes is the perfect amount of time to fall asleep. Like if you're starting to feel tired and it helps you kind of fall asleep a little bit, but it's not so much that you wake up where you're like, I can't do anything else. Like you, you can't function. It's a functional nap. And I have a white noise app on my phone. So I literally nap in the middle of the house with the kids. I'm like, I'm taking my, I'm taking my timer nap. And they're like, okay, mom, see you in 17 minutes. It's so incredible. Like I have so many questions. I have so many questions about that. So you have perfected, obviously, the capacity to fall almost immediately asleep. If I feel it coming. You know when you're sitting there and you're like, if I closed my eyes, I would be out. And so it's that kind of vibe. If you feel your body getting to that place, I go, I'm going to go take a nap because I don't want to have to power through and be angry for the rest of the day. So I would rather just disappear from everyone for 17 minutes and then I'll come back, you know, a better person or whatever. So just one more question about this. This is really important to me. <laughs> so like, Take your pants off, get under your covers. Sometimes. I actually, you know what? I'm going to say I don't usually take my pants off. If If there's another adult in the house, I will take my pants off because it's not quite on me if something catches on fire and I have to jump out. But I do usually get under my covers if I'm in the bed. But sometimes I'll just get on the couch in a blanket and do the thing. Yeah. And at the 17 minute mark, it goes off and you're like, I feel better. I do every time. It's never not worked. It's so bizarre. I don't know. I don't know, you guys. Okay. That's great. Well, see, you guys, this is the sort of content we're going to bring you for the next hour. <laughs> like, get excited because honestly, Kendra's about to make your life better. Okay. Tell us your deal. Yeah. Okay. So um, I, I, I did sort of detour that, didn't I? So I. So uh, I well, did. I asked you three follow up questions about that. <laughs> so it's okay. <laughs> We were on the same page. Yeah, so I, well, kind of my like bio highlights, I am married. I have three kids. I live in the town where I was born. Like I have always lived in the same city, which I personally just really love. I love roots. And so, but I've been writing on the internet for over 10 years. And I went to school to be a high school English teacher and then realized I don't really like teenagers. Trouble. And so- <laughs> tricky. That's a tricky career path at that point. (laughs) I kind of thought I should get out now before I like hurt people's feelings. Like let's let's just not be in the classroom. Formative years. Yeah, exactly. So I started to just do like copywriting stuff and, you know, so I've always been a writer, but I also have always tried to be a genius. Like the lazy genius sort of came later. I am a recovering perfectionist, always trying really hard at everything, wanting to please everybody, be good at everything, not being objectionable to anyone. You know, I grew up in the South, evangelical vibe. You know, I'm very like apple pie, like American apple pie person. There's nothing objectionable about my story. (laughs) There's just, you know, it's not. That's so pure. It is. And so like I did the whole, I didn't cheat on tests. I didn't drink until I was allowed. I didn't have sex until I was married. Like all the things that you're told to not do. I did all of it. And guess what, Jen? I still felt like a failure and was so tired all the time. Fancy that. So I think then when I had kids, and I have three, my oldest is 10. When I had my son, Sam, I did what many new moms do, where I was like, well, this is stupid. I don't have energy for anything. Why am I trying so hard? But I swung the other way of like, well, I'm just not going to try it anything. I don't care anymore. But that was also really tiring. And it confused me. Like, wait a minute. I don't care anymore. Why am I so tired? And I think it's, not I think it's because, I know it's because I was not letting myself care about the things that mattered to me. And so I just sort of felt like caring equal trying too hard just across the board. But then realizing, no, like we can care. (laughs) 
<laughs> like what a silly thing <laughs> to think as a human being, we're not allowed to care about things. And so as I started to find that middle way, that third way of you don't have to just try hard or give up. You can care about the things that matter to you, but then you can sort of let the other stuff go. And my life started to change. And then I was like, I want to tell other people about this. I don't hear enough words about this. So I'm going to start saying some. And that was five years ago. Yeah. This may just tank right in the water because I don't know if you do this, but do you know your Enneagram number? I do. I am very Is much. One? Yeah, I'm a one. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Ones are so wonderful in the world the way that you perceive the world and move through it is so, it can be such a fantastic way to live. And that Achilles is hard. That like perfectionist, that's real work to overcome. And so that is helpful for some of my listeners because anybody who kind of self-identifies along the perfectionist fault lines, every tune in, like it is possible. (laughs) It is possible for that not to like control your every waking thought. And uh, I'm a three. So I have some tendencies like this. The minor less perfection and more quantity, like how much can I do and do really, really, really well at it. And so I understand a lot of the undercurrents of what you're saying are some of my own personal demons too. So it's interesting when I think about this kind of five-year practice now that you've settled into, which that's enough time to know how something's going to affect your life, you know, five years. So sounds like that might've been the perfect prep for getting to a year like 2020. (laughs) Not in our wildest imaginations. Can you just talk to us a little bit? Because our listeners are primarily women kind of like us. They're right kind of in the space of life that you and I are in. Can you talk about what your personal year has been like? What plans you've had to change? And then maybe a couple of the tenets of being a lazy genius. How have those helped you weather this year? Maybe in a way that you wouldn't have before. Yeah. Well, I think the biggest plan that had to change I had to launch a book during the pandemic. Yeah, that was un- so unfortunate. It's so unfortunate. <laughs> like, so unfortunate. And it's my first book. And Sorry, that's a real bummer. I had a lot of excitement around certain parts of it. And the parts that I was the most excited about were the ones that the pandemic was like, I'm sorry. No, thank you. So the live, yeah, the live event. Long. Yes, like traveling and I didn't get to do any of those things. And it was something I had to grieve. You know, I think I think that's one thing that I haven't heard talked about as much. I think it's just because we're all in it and trying to, there's no recovery yet. Like we're in co- like constant recovery, you know? And so there's not a lot of permission to grieve these things that we've lost because we feel sort of silly. Like, like I think about something like uh, Wonder Woman coming out. I want to see Wonder Woman in the theaters and I can't and I'm so mad. You know, like I was excited about it in the summer and it feels like there are people being killed. There are people dying of so many things, people losing all of their stuff in these fires. Like there's so much happening around us that is much stronger and more important than going to see Wonder Woman in the theaters. But if we don't acknowledge the things that we are personally grieving, if we like stuff those things down and try to do the whole starving children in Africa comparison that I grew up with. I feel like a lot of us grew up with, you know, clear your plate because there are people starving, which is like perspective is a good thing. But if we stuff everything down and don't grieve our own losses, we're not able to actually be there for the people who need us in their own grief, no matter what kind of grief it is. It's like the spectrum of grief. And so I just had to sort of grieve. Like I don't get to have a live event. (laughs) And that's really sad to me. It's really a bummer. However, The Lazy Genius Way, which is the book I wrote, The Lazy Genius Way, it's 13 principles. And that's why my pitch in the beginning when I wrote this book, I was like, I want to write a book where you could literally lazy genius anything. Like that's the promise. And then 2020 happened. And I was like, you guys, we actually, this this holds up. Like you can lazy genius a pandemic. You actually can. I did not know that that was possible because who knew we were going to be in this? But like things like the live event, for example, what it allowed me to do, those principles allowed me to do was to back up and go, okay, what matters right now? And not in a, well, my family matters. And not in like trying to give Jesus answers. Yes. It was more like what mattered to me about the live event? What matters to me about the actual launch day of the book? Like be specific and get into it. 
And so I was like, well, what matters to me is I don't want to be scrolling the computer all day, like refreshing Amazon rankings. I don't want to do that because that just gets me into a spiral of, you know, it reignites those perfectionistic muscles. Somebody gave you some good advice on that, sis. That took me a few books to (laughs) figure out, but that wasn't super great for my mental health. Not super it's not and great. So good on you for knowing in advance. Stay away. Stay away. <laughs> because even if like 1,000 of them are absolutely beautiful, it's that one. It is that one. That's the one you think about at night when you go to bed. And even if you hit like number whatever, you're like, I would lose my mind if I was in the top 100 of all Amazon books or whatever. And then you get in it and you're 98. And you're like, well, can I get to 97? Could I get to 75? Could I get to... It's never ending. Like the finish line just keeps moving. And so I got in my car... Here's how I lazy genius my launch day. I was like, I'm not going to scroll, but I do. What also matters to me is I want to connect with readers if I can. And also I need content for Instagram. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to get in my car and I'm going to drive back roads and listen to music because that combination of things is one of my most like Zen feel like a person choices. And so I drove like a big loop around my state of North Carolina and visited independent bookstores that knew I was coming and signed books and told people where I was going to be. And so some readers came out and I got to sign their books like spread across parking lots or whatever. It was literally the best day. And it was nothing like I envisioned in the beginning, but it's because I grieved that loss. And then I was like, all right, so what matters here? And we're going to apply some principles to this to still make it work. And I mean, it wasn't ideal and I wouldn't necessarily choose it again. But at the same time, it's better than not choosing anything at all and just being depressed about it. You're right. I want to drill into that a little bit more. You mentioned this. You and your husband have three small people at home. Like you're in the younger sector. How far apart in ages are your kids? My boys are 10 and 8. Uh-huh. And then my daughter Annie is 4. Okay, 10, 8, and 4. Mm-hmm. So mine were all two years apart when they were little, when I had three before our adoption. And so I'm thinking back to that season of life um, when they were younger, when they were little, and how I felt constantly sort of walloped by this message of, and this was real trendy at the time, like find a life that's peaceful, but also very, very productive. And it was crazy making. And it was a garbage thing to tell new parents because it's so hard to find that sort of balance. And I put balance in quotes. So with the lazy genius way, as you're sort of unpacking for us right now, you're, you are offering something different with this idea of name what matters, ditch what doesn't. And you just gave a really good example in your own life. Just, can you talk a little bit more about this? Cause this is a real underpinning of what you have to offer the readers. Why is this concept such a game changer? Well, I think about with motherhood specifically, especially new motherhood, I don't know that there's another time of life that is full of so many voices telling you what should matter. (laughs) It's just constant. It's constant. People you know, people you don't know, all the people you follow on such all the things. There's so many voices. I mean, I would even, you know, just like strangers of the park and they make comments and you feel immediately judged by them or my kids are wearing different shoes than these kids and are their feet going to grow inappropriately? (laughs) Because I mean, we get crazy. And I think part of that too is that like, we don't have a filter for processing that stuff, number one. And number two, we already are energy depleted. And so we don't have sort of that margin to even sift through those voices that we're hearing. So it's kind of like a double whammy where we're, we're sort of like behind before we begin. And so without a filter of what to name and how to sort through that stuff, the what matters and the what doesn't, that's when you lose your mind. So I think specifically for motherhood, an example would be like how you feed your little kids, your tiny humans. What matters is you feed, I mean, they need to eat. Like that's really important. But then you think about things like convenience, a very limited budget. You buy things or you make things. Food is super fresh. Variety, it tastes really good. You can't have all of those things. Like we sort of tell ourselves that we are, it's up to us to make all of those things happen. It's sort of like when I call it house hunter syndrome, when you're like, so we want seven bedrooms, an open floor plan kitchen, all the landscaping done, and we have $12. (laughs) Yeah, totally. 
I hate that. <laughs> You're like, that's not how it works. You can't do that. But we do that to ourselves. Like we, we assume that we're supposed to fix delicious food and we want it quick and we want it cheap, but we also want like really high quality and we don't want to have to work too hard, but also we need to like stir all day because that's romantic and old fashioned. And that there are too many things, even about as something as simple as feeding our families. And so that is why these things are important. You name what actually matters to me. I'm on a budget. Okay, so that means that we are going to eat from a, we're not going to eat as many this kinds of foods, or we're not going to get a lot of convenience foods. So I need to have more time to prep stuff or plan stuff. That means I have to let some other stuff go. So it just kind of gives you a filter on what it means to live a meaningful life for you. Like, what does that mean for you? Because if you try to do all of it, you'd start talking louder and faster like I am because it's so stressful. It's so stressful. I love that. And I also like how you are right. That can apply to almost anything. Whatever is on our plate, whatever is feeling overwhelming to us. So what, you know, immediately most women are going to have to release with some sort of narrative. I think that's what, you know, some narrative. This is what good moms do. This is what a good entrepreneur does. This is what a good friend does. And yeah, and rather realize that all those are sort of invented constructs anyway. And there's a million facets of everything. And so this gets easier for me. How old are you? Is that an okay thing for me to ask? Super okay. I'm 38. Yeah. So I'm just a little bit ahead of you. I'm 46. And I notice for me, this becomes a little bit more natural the older I get as well. And so applying those principles early on is so smart because the longer you put them into practice, one day you're going to wake up and be like, I don't even care that they're eating these chicken nuggets out of the freezer. You know what I mean? Or whatever the thing is. Taking time to relax is more important than ever. It's true for me, whether I'm sitting on the porch with my girlfriends or running a bath. But if I need a few minutes to give my brain a break, I hit up my favorite new game on my phone. It's called Solitaire Grand Harvest. Solitaire Grand Harvest is solitaire, but like you've never seen. All wrapped up in this super soothing farm aesthetic. It's free to play, and I can't stop playing it. Listen, give me about 10 minutes with it, and I'm a completely different person. I'm calmer. I'm nicer. I don't know if it's the sound of water in a creek or the birds singing in the wind, but Solitaire Grand Harvest is hypnotic, and I love it. So whether you're stuck inside or just dreaming of the great outdoors. Now you can have a fun kind of farm style getaway right at your fingertips. So download Solitaire Grand Harvest for free today in the Apple App Store, Google Play, and Amazon. Guys, I have the most amazing service. It's called FrameBridge. And FrameBridge makes it easier and more affordable than ever to frame your favorite things, here's key, without ever leaving your house, yay. From art prints and posters to the photos sitting on your phone, you can use FrameBridge for just about anything. And here's a pro tip. FrameBridge is the perfect way to give easy and of course thoughtful gifts. I may have FrameBridged a few photos right from my phone and put them in these adorable little gold frames so that people can hang them right from their Christmas trees. How cute, I can't get over it. Anyway, here's how it all works. Go to framebridge.com and upload your photo, or they'll send you packaging to safely mail in your physical pieces. Then you can preview your item online in dozens of frame styles and gallery wall layouts. Choose your favorite, or you can get free recommendations from their very talented designers. And then the experts at Framebridge will custom frame your item and deliver your finished piece straight to you or anyone on your list. A handcrafted personalized gift from Framebridge starts at $39 and all shipping is free. Plus, my listeners will get 15% off your first order at framebridge.com when you use my code for the love. So get started today, frame your photos or send someone the perfect gift. Go to framebridge.com and use promo code for the love to save an additional 15% off your first order. Okay. Framebridge.com promo code for the love. All right. Back to our show. 
You mentioned this earlier, but I'd like for you to talk a little bit more about it because it is a tendency that I also sometimes see in my community of women. This pendulum that you discussed at the very beginning on the very first question of caring too much about all the wrong things to zero. I don't care at all. I'm like, I'm a big sloppy mess. That kind of sloppy mess thing is kind of, there's some appeal to it. Yeah, there's a badge of honor to it somehow. Yes, exactly, like a badge of honor. And so, you know, you said, when you care about everything, you do nothing well. That's what you wrote. I'd like to just hear you discuss that a little bit further. Why do you think that is? Why are women tempted to either be perfect at everything or just throw in the towel. I'm a huge mess, whatever. I can't do anything and I don't care. What's at the root of that? And how would you suggest, like, how do we begin to climb out of that hole? I wonder if, like, as human beings, I don't think we have a great grasp of the proper context of failing and being disappointed or being disappointing for whatever reason, like, you know, we we all on some level equate love and value with succeeding and making people happy, right? To some degree. And so I think that, like, we're going to fail. We are going to disappoint people. People are going to fail us. People are going to disappoint us. And so, but we don't always live like that's part of being a person. So I grew up, I already said this before, I grew up in, you know, Southern evangelical. And it was never said explicitly if you do this, God will love you or do this so that God will love you. But there was this like implicit between the lines thing. And I had this underlying belief that, but he would love me more. Maybe he would love me more <laughs> if I was good. Like if I didn't really mess up or if I didn't fail or if I dis- didn't disappoint him. And and so I think that, okay, so if we are humans who are wired for relationship and connection, But we are operating from the belief that that relationship and connection is only as good as how good we are. Like if we take disappointment and failure out of the picture, if we don't keep, like you said, a narrative, if we don't keep that as part of our narrative of like, this is just part of being a human, then our only choices, the only choices we have are to try hard to be perfect or to give up at everything because there there is no middle ground. Because if you're like, the only way that I can be loved and have value is by not failing anyone and not disappointing anyone and also by not being in relationships where I am failed and I am disappointed, then we are going to try, 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 try. And then when we- Back in Enneagram 3. You just like wrote our script. (laughs) Uh, I'm nodding like, yeah. 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 Or we get to the point where we literally, I mean, I have a friend who I believe that you know or know of, Erin Moon of Jamie and Knox podcast or whatever. And she's in Enneagram 3. And like, she talked to me one time about having actual adrenal fatigue because of how hard she was working. And it's like, we change our body chemistry to a point where it won't work anymore. And so then we feel like our only choice is to just give up because trying is too hard. But it's because we're trying with this context of our choices are rooted in some false script of if we mess up, then we're out. If we mess up, then everybody's leaving. If we mess up or if someone fails us, then we chose wrong. It's just garbage. It's just garbage in our heads. And it keeps us from living well in the context of what does matter to us, but also the proper context of we are going to mess up. We are going to be failed. Like people are going to fail us. So rather than working so hard to avoid those things, if we can just be rooted, wholehearted people and move into those relationships and those connections with the true narrative of the situation, then it is tiring to have those conversations, but it's not tiring to wake up in the morning when they're done. You know, you're like, it's a connective conversation. It's not a protective conversation. Okay, this is something else you say, which I love. You call it Monday brain. And I have said something to this effect. I haven't given it such a short and succinct, beautiful name, but that Monday brain is a real thing. So can we talk about that and how your concept of decide once on one thing, principle, is an awesome antidote for Monday brain and beyond. Yeah. So the idea of decide once is that you just make a decision one time and you don't have to make it again. And you can make a decision about anything at any time for any reason. It's up to you. That's why it's a principle. It's so great. It works for all the people. Monday brain, I mean, we all have it. You wake up and you're like, wait, what's happening? And there's so much in front of you. It just feels, I don't know. There's something about potential and possibility 
appointment schedules and you're going to miss something and you're told that you need to be really well prepared and oh, I don't have a meal plan. I don't have the schedule color coded on Google Calendar yet. I don't have my grocery list made. I don't have, you know, I don't have, I don't have. For things that you don't even need, like some of those things you might not even need, but because you're telling yourself you do, then the energy is taken, it's done. So the idea behind Decide Once, especially for Monday Brain, is what are some things that you, or not even some things, what is one thing that you can decide one time that you do every single Monday or maybe Sunday night or whatever, but one thing that kind of helps your Monday Brain. So it could be like what you're going to wear, what you're going to eat, what you're going to read, what you're going to do. Like you're not going to run errands on Mondays or you are going to run errands on Mondays because then you get everything done and then you feel better about it or whatever. When you're going to get up, when you're going to make your to-do to list, when you're going to take your nap, go ahead and decide, like pick one thing that feels like it's going to sort of benefit the other things. You know, like what is something that you can just kind of take off of your decision-making? So for me, I have a Monday uniform. So I wear... I wear denim and black every Monday, no matter the season. Truth be told, I wear denim and black most days. Like that's not a hard choice. But definitely on Mondays. <laughs> definitely on Mondays. <laughs> but it's so nice to just not have to think about it. We normally eat spaghetti on Mondays. It's pasta Monday. We just, it's like, let's just have spaghetti. It's easy. I don't have to think about it. And so having some of those choices can really help give that margin that you need for Monday brain. But I will say the irony, the irony of this is I, so Monday Brain, I put in an Instagram post a couple of weeks ago. Do you know what happened on that very day? We got in a car accident. That was what happened that exact day. And so the thing that I feel like is important to say is that none of these things will save you. None of these systems that you create are going to save you. If it does, if something happens that kind of upends what you planned, that does not mean that your plan was wrong. It does not mean that your system doesn't work. It just means that systems aren't always going to save you in the way that you think, or they're not, they're not always going to show up because it's life. It's a fluid life. And so it was really kind of ironic. A friend of mine was like, well, that'll get your Monday brain. (laughs) I boxed and I was like, we were in a car accident. And you know, she's like, well, that'll do it to a Monday brain. So it's so great to have these things that can help us. But if we kind of grasp, like if we're just grasping, gripping them so hard that they're going to fix everything and we do too many at one time. That's why it's like, just do one thing, start with one thing. That's another lazy genius principles to start small. Don't build all this stuff so big. Then you're going to be at the service, at the mercy of tending to this big machine, to the system that you think is going to save you rather than just like spending your energy on what matters to you. It's just, that's why we're still tired because we're building it too big rather than just deciding once about one thing. I wish I'd have heard you say that 15 years ago when I about once a year would lock myself into the most complex, complicated chore chart system any person has ever even invented. Like it required like a a chalkboard wall, you know, it it was so over the top. And I'm like, this is it. Finally, I'm going to get my crap together. These kids are going to pull their weight. Here's the stickers. Here's the marbles. Here's the uh, cards. Yeah, whatever. Yeah. If I could add an element, I found a way to do it. And of course it was my boss. It was my beast. It was, it ruled me. And it lasted for anywhere between nine and 14 days. And then I would just throw in the towel because I did too much. And so I really think that principle of just, let's just back it down. Let's start with one thing. Because it's really, this, you know, this whole series is called Small Wins. And it is almost miraculous the impact little small dial adjustments like this make. It doesn't sound that big of a deal when you say it. But when you work into your Monday, this is what I'm going to wear. And this is what I'm making for dinner. I'm going to just solve those two things. There is like a freedom in it that holds a little bit of weight off the total plate. And it counts and it matters. We touched on this a minute ago, but you have some really great advice on why we need to schedule rest rather than just waiting until exhaustion literally mows us down and we can't move for three days, which is That's my preferred method (laughs) when I'm like, I need a whole new job. I don't know what it's going to be, but I think part of what makes this idea of yours so great is because you kind of help us redefine rest. And I think this is important because this is not a one size fits all self-care approach. Like get a manicure and you'll feel better. That just doesn't work for so many people. That's not what it is. It can be completely different for each of us. So what advice would you give to the person 
who struggles with even choosing to schedule rest. And then like maybe a little bit of parameters around what that might look like. Yeah. So I think the place it starts, if you're looking at the principle of schedule rest, just start with the schedule, just schedule it. Like you don't have to name what it is yet. I think that's the thing is we think that if we don't know what's going to fill the time, we're waiting for that before we schedule the time. So I would just say like, go ahead and schedule it. So you can do seasonal, seasonal rest where it's like maybe every quarter you do a day, like a full day or a weekend, or maybe it's once a month or once a week where it's two hours or just whatever it is, schedule it, schedule it, schedule it, get help. This is a priority. If you feel if you feel guilty or you feel like it is not part of your needs as a human to say to a spouse or partner or anybody who is supportive of you, hey, I would like two hours to myself once a week. Like if you say that out loud, think about that. Two hours once a week. And so many women who I know feel devastatingly guilty for asking for that. And it's like, you guys, you are worth way more than two hours a week. But also like, let's just start with that. Do something, like do something. And so go ahead and schedule it. Go ahead and get it on the calendar, get the help and then leave your house or whatever it is that you're going to do. That's the first step is to schedule it and then follow through. And then once you do that, then you can actually, like if you're not sure what rest looks like for you, like some people rest is being with other humans. It doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to walk through the woods by yourself for two hours or you're going to sleep or you're going to goal set. It doesn't have to be what you think it is. All it is, rest is you are reminding yourself of who you are. You are getting back to your center. Whatever that looks like for you, you do it. So for me, and and you have probably multiple things that you maybe haven't named yet. You know, you don't know that those are restful things because maybe they don't look like rest tends to look when you people talk about rest and self-care. And so like mine, like I mentioned already, I love to drive through nature and listen to music. It's like one of my favorite things ever. Reading, baking, being outside. It's usually like a combination of food, nature, and music. Like something with that, I am a changed human. I'm back to where I can be and I feel completely refueled. And so if you don't know what that is, and I've had so Many, so many women contact me over the years of saying, I don't know what it means to take care of myself. I don't know what makes me feel like myself. I don't know. That's why I say schedule it first and then try things. Just spend the time paying attention to doing whatever it is that you want to do and go, do I feel better now? Like, do I feel like myself? And then if you do, do that again. Do that. We put so much pressure on it having to look a certain way. So just try. And if you get it wrong, it's not really wrong. It's just like, well, that's not it. Let's do it again. It's not a waste. You're learning. It's not a waste. Oh, gosh, I love that. I like that freedom pass. Because I'm one of those, it's funny to even say this because I'm introverted, but when I'm in the grind of work and parenting and responsibilities, it is my friends who make me feel renewed. and So I'm one of those people for whom that answer for me is to sit on a porch with my best friends. We could talk about nothing. We could talk about everything. It matters not. But at the end of that, I'm back. I'm not mean anymore. I've laid down the horrible way I'm talking to everybody. (laughs) Right. (laughs) I actually like that phrase. I feel like that's a good phrase for people to be like, oh, I'm back. Because I think we know what that feels like when we feel like, oh, I'm back. And so to even ask, I I love that, just to ask yourself as you're doing things, like what has made you say that or something like that before and do that again with intention on a regular basis. And I love that you just said that too, Jen, because it's not, it's not scheduling some sort of like, you have to get a hotel room or you have to find a mountain to stand next to or whatever. It's just like plan a night with your girlfriends once every couple of weeks where they just come over and sit on a porch. Like what a gift that is. And we don't, We don't do that kind of thing often enough. We just don't do it. It's so true. For a long time, I think the whole notion of self-care was really hooked in to consumerism. It was something you needed to buy, you needed to pay for, you needed to travel to. And so just like that, that would take out most average people who can't just afford to nurture whatever it is that's so costly. But your friends can sit on your porch for free. They sure can. can. 
They can drink water. They can BYOB. Right. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> and if you don't have a porch, go somewhere that has one. Go to, I saw a group of women in a Target parking lot with their minivans backed up, like in like a star with all of their trunks open and they were sitting in their trunks because the pandemic makes us do things like this. But they were literally in a parking lot, a Target parking lot, chatting. Like, there's no excuse. And I don't mean that in a mean way. I mean that in a bossy big sister way. Like, there's no excuse. You can be with your people or do what you need to do. You just have to choose that it matters. You have to say that it matters. Those women went to their mothership. They're like, you know what? Target. That's where. Not in a park. No. We want a concrete parking lot in front of Target. That is our home base. I really respect that. Okay. I'm also a big fan of your batching system for things like laundry and kitchen cleanup. This is just stuff we have to do. Like we can't glamorize our lives. This is part of life. And so this concept applies to tons of mundane tasks that we just, we have to do. Can you talk about this for a minute and why it really is so stupid, easy, and genius? Yeah. So the the principle of batching is not new. We have all heard it. It's basically doing the same kind of task like over and over and over again. Something that we do repeatedly, but sort of spread out, do it all at once. Or if there's something that we do that we have to undo, like we keep finding ourselves undoing it. Like I always think about the dishwasher and this is why people think I'm crazy when I talk about there is a correct order to uh, cleaning up your kitchen, but it's true. What you're doing is you are at, you're in a pinball machine, just kind of bouncing around your kitchen, picking up one thing and the next thing and yelling at somebody to come get this plate. And then you see a cup over in a different room and you load the dishwasher and it's full and you're like, I did it. And then you find a stack of dishes in another room and you want to burn everything down. Or I will speak for myself. I want to burn everything down. Like it drives me crazy that I have to undo. Here's the way you do the kitchen. So you need zones when you clean up your kitchen, okay? You need a dirty dishes zone, a fridge zone, and then like a pantry type stuff zone, what you want to do is clean off one section at a time. So you're sort of like breaking your space into little quadrants or whatever. But quadrants wouldn't work because it could be more than four. We'll pretend it's four. So it's like your kitchen table. So you're going to clean off everything off your kitchen table so you could start to feel some progress that like things are happening. Because you know when you look around and it's, there's just junk everywhere. And you're like, how do I even begin cleaning this mess up? Start with one space. You clean everything off and you put it in its zones. So you throw away the trash. You just put the dirty dishes just on the counter in their dirty dishes zone. Don't do anything to them yet. Put the food that has to go on the fridge in the fridge zone. Don't put it in the fridge yet. Because then what you're doing is you have to play fridge Tetris where you like put things in one at a time and then stuff doesn't fit and you have to take it out. That's why we batch. That's why we gather everything that goes in the fridge. You put it away at once. You gather all the dirty dishes in one place. You put them all away at once because then you can know how to load so that everything fits. And you kind of go through all your little sections. I have an entire podcast episode about how to clean the kitchen. That's how much passion I have about this. <laughs> Listen, you know, we can't care about everything, but we need to care about something. And kitchen cleanup is a daily thing. It is. It's and multi-daily. I don't know anyone, truly. I don't know anyone who thrives in a constantly dirty kitchen. Totally true. And that's one of those things that we sort of tell ourselves like, well, I just don't care. Like, I just don't care. I really think you do. And I'm not saying that like that cleanliness is next to godliness or any crap like that. It's more like it's hard to function because like you said, it's a constant room that we're using. And if you live with other humans, especially ones that are tinier than you, like you're there all the time. And so doing things that help you care about that space so that you as a human can function better and that room can serve you and your family the way it's intended to, and you might actually like being in there, it's worth being a genius about cleaning the kitchen. It just is. It just is. It just is. I love it. Batching saves a lot of time and energy. And it's not hard. That's not a hard concept. It's very possible. That's just a toggle switch. And sometimes it's easier. Like, honestly, sometimes it's easier. Like, rather than, I think about mail, like, rather than going through every single piece of mail when it comes into your house, a way of batching, honestly, is to, like at the end of every week, go through the stack of mail. Like don't even really do anything with it yet because you're going through all the mail at once rather than every single piece, you know, the minute it hits your life. So in some ways, batching actually is less work. It's less work. This holiday season, more people will be mailing their stuff than literally ever before. That means the post office is going to be super busy and I don't have time for that. 
Lucky for us, Stamps.com brings the post office and now UPS shipping right to your computer. It's so easy. You just use your computer to print official U.S. postage 24-7 for literally any letter, any package, any class of mail for anywhere you want to send. This is like all my dreams come true. Once your mail is ready, all you do is schedule a pickup or drop off. It's that, it really is that simple. With stamps.com, you get five cents off every first class stamp and up to 40% off priority mail and up to 62% off UPS shipping rates. It's a great deal. Whether you're looking to send gifts to loved ones or you're a small business looking to ship to customers. Guys, just don't spend a minute of your holiday season at the post office this year. Not one minute. Sign up for stamps.com instead. There's no risk. With my promo code for the love, you get a special offer that includes a four week trial plus free postage and a digital scale. No long term commitments, no contracts. Just go to stamps.com, click on the microphone at the top of the homepage, and type in for the love. Okay, so it's stamps.com and then enter for the love. Even if you can't be with all of your people this holiday season, you can still bring them together with the gift of family history at Ancestry. Right now, the holiday sale at Ancestry is the perfect time to treat someone you love to a gift that connects them to family in obviously new and meaningful ways. Find amazing prices on gifts like an Ancestry gift membership that'll let your loved one discover the fascinating people in their past, or you can surprise them with Ancestry DNA so they can uncover their origins. You already know how much I love Ancestry. I've used it to figure out where my ancestors were from, and there's something special about knowing the people who came before me are almost entirely from the UK, and thinking about the history they lived through there, I feel it makes me feel more rooted in who I am. So don't miss special holiday pricing on truly meaningful gifts during the holiday sale at Ancestry. Head to my URL at Ancestry.com slash for the love to get your Ancestry health kit today. Okay, it's Ancestry.com slash for the love. All right, back to our show. Okay. I'm going to ask one more question, then we'll start landing the plane here. You encourage us to keep evaluating our present season as we adjust what matters in that specific set of circumstances. You said, you wrote, living in your season means letting your frustrations breathe, but not be in charge. Oh, that's like timely and important and hard. Can you share a bit more about why this idea can really be such a breath of fresh air for all of us? Like truly a small win worth celebrating, worth seizing onto right now in this year when we have a truckload of frustrations. I mean, everything from frustration to sorrow. How do we let our frustrations breathe but not be in charge? What does that mean? I love that you actually used that word sorrow because that was a word that came to mind too. It's, It's what I said a little bit before about having permission to grieve. Like we need permission to be frustrated. We need permission to be sorrowful, to despair, to be angry. I think about, I don't know if you saw it, Sarah Bessie had an Instagram post a while back that said, anger can serve as a great igniter, but it will prove to be inadequate for sustaining us over the long game to actually change the world. You could sub in anything for anger, I think, that certain things are like spotlights on what matters to us. If we're feeling angry or frustrated, we're all frustrated about different things in 2020, you know? But if we pay attention to what we are frustrated by and not let it just run us (laughs) through the mud and run over people, or if we listen to our sorrow rather than just letting it put us in a hole in the ground where we just don't want to talk to anybody ever. Like we can still be sad. We need permission to feel those things, but that there is also like a little radar. There's a little curiosity about what is that sorrow pointing to? What is that anger pointing to? What's actually happening? And what that does is it gives us a path rather than like just swimming in like a pond of muck. You know, we're just like in this constrained area of grossness, frustration, anger, whatever it is. It just feels like there's, we're not going anywhere, that we're stuck. That's the whole thing about living in our season. When we're in hard seasons, it feels like we're stuck. And by paying attention to what those emotions are telling us, it gives us a way out. 
And it doesn't dismiss what got us there. It doesn't dismiss the sorrow or the anger or the frustration or the despair or the fear. It doesn't dismiss those things, but they create stepping stones of, well, what's actually mattering to me? It like opens you up. If that sounds very woo-woo, but like it really does kind of change your posture towards life and towards your season. And it's not a strong, like, I'm going to beat this. It's not going to take me. It's like, I'm going to show it. I'm going to show it who's by. Like that energy to me personally is really exhausting. That's a hard energy to carry as well. And so that's where that middle exists. It's not like be super angry at everything or I give up. I don't know what to do. I just give up. It is letting it tell you something. It's letting it teach you something. Be curious about it, not being ashamed for feeling it. And then I think that it completely takes the veils off. It's like one of those Claritin commercials where they're like, and now I'm Claritin clear or whatever. And you're like, oh, I didn't realize life was fuzzy. I didn't realize I couldn't see anything. I didn't realize I was living in a blur. But now those scales have sort of fallen off and I'm still in the season, but I see it differently because I'm learning from these emotions and these experiences that I wouldn't choose but they're here. This is what's happening. So I'm going to be a companion to those things. And I'm going to let those things teach me something. It is the path out. It's just the truth. We're so deeply pain averse. And we were taught that, that pain in some way is a signal that we're doing it wrong. You know, that we've we've gotten it wrong. We're not, we're not doing this life right. That's just not true. Pain is how life is. And so there is a weird freedom in just saying, I will feel this and I will let it be my teacher. And if I need to cry my eyes out, I will do that. And it's just strange. It is what brings you to the other side of it. And there's no other way because we bury that stuff alive, man. I mean, we can pretend that it didn't hurt or we're not in deeply in sorrow or we're just angry, but it will come out. It'll come out sideways. It'll come out later. It will hurt our bodies, harm our bodies. Our bodies tell us what's true. I mean, I notice this in my body all the time when it starts rebelling against me, like you will deal with your feelings or we will get the flu. So you, (laughs) you choose which way do you want to do this? I really love that. And I think that is the most perfect way to sort of land your messaging here on this particular interview. Okay, here's what we're going to do. We're going to wrap it up. These are three questions that I am asking everybody in the small wins series. Just top of your head, whatever, whatever you got. You could probably have more than one answer, but you can just pick one. Here's the first one. What is something that you have been grateful for this year? This is a strange one. I am grateful that I read Jaber Crow by Wendell Berry at the beginning of the pandemic. It's been on my list for years, 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 years. And I just, I'm a dystopian girl. I'm like a like stick it to the patriarchy kind of fiction person. And so Wendell Berry is not exactly that, you know, it's a very different vibe. He's a tender soul. <laughs> so Jaber Crow though has been on my list forever. And I mean, in, I think it was March, which is when it, for us, it was the middle of March when it was like, don't go anywhere, don't leave your house and everything shut down. And I started to read Jaber Crow and there was this, talk about like scales falling off. Like it was a sacred read. That whole like reading the right book at the right time. It is the most right book at the most right time of my entire life, honestly. And so it was such a gift that I keep thinking, like, I'm going to reread it this fall. I just read it six months ago. I'm going to read it again. I just loved it so much. It was such a, I mean, it's Wendell Berry. It's great. And the point isn't really the book. But I'm so grateful that I was able to enter into that space of nature and gratitude and stillness and slowness through that story in a time where I was fighting the stillness and slowness and so I was really fighting it. Jaber Crow is just this beautiful guide into this life that we now lead. So I'm really, really grateful Aww. I read it. Okay, everybody, we will link to that. I've never read that. It's so good, Jen. It's so good. How about this? What's maybe one small way, because we can always find it if we're looking for it, that 2020 has changed you maybe for the better? I am far less dependent on lists. I think, which has been, I mean, lists themselves are not bad at all. They're really important, actually. You need, I think you need lists to a point to be able to like function as a human in this society. But I definitely use lists as quite the crutch. There's so many lists. I've been given books of lists as like birthday presents. Like that's how much my people know. (laughs) It's not so much like 
I'm learning that lists are not great. No, it's I'm just less dependent on them. And again, it's like this really lovely freedom that I don't know that I would have learned otherwise. Like we're all slowing down and sort of being thrown into the deep end of figuring out what matters to us. And so it's just a lovely thing to go, I'm not responsible for everybody. I've been making lists out of this like deep sense of responsibility for every single person in my life and every single thing that they have to do and everything that I want to do and need to do and all that. And so I think the letting go a little bit of the grip on those lists in 2020 has been really delightful. It's been really lovely. Everybody gets this one. Every single series, every guest, Barbara Brown Taylor's question and however you want to answer it is how exactly how I want to hear it. So what is saving your life right now? Hamilton. You don't understand. <laughs> so much. Are you new to Hamilton? I'm newish. Yeah. Like I didn't, I had listened to a couple of songs when everybody started talking about it, but I just didn't understand what was happening. And I don't know. And then I saw it when it came out on Disney Plus, like within a, a week or whatever. I listened to a, some part of the soundtrack every single day. I have done the deep dive on every Jonathan Groff interview. And it has been such a gift because it is joyful. It is important. It is excellent. Like those are things that my personal 2020 really, really needs. So it's legit. Like the number of times that I have just cried, not just because the song is beautiful, but I'm like, I don't know what my life would be like if I didn't have Hamilton in it right now. Like it's just, it's been such a gift. I literally know. I was new. I was late to Hamilton. I saw it in February on Broadway. And zero exposure, none, none. I hadn't heard a song. I didn't know anything about anything. And I almost lost my mind. Like, I, I'm not kidding. Like, I felt like I had, was in a fever dream for about <laughs> a month. You know, I just could not stop. I could not quit listening to it. I could not quit reading all the lyrics. I dreamed about it. I still dream about it. And I sing it in my head all the time. I've seen the Disney Plus version of Hamilton easily, easily 25 times, easily. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't, I'm not sorry. Like, I'm not, I'm not sorry. It's two and a half hours every time. Who has two and a half hours to sit down and watch it again? I do. Who's your favorite character? Or what's your favorite song? Or what's your favorite moment? Yeah, okay. I had to figure it out because I have a favorite performance and then a favorite character. My favorite performance is Leslie Odom Jr. as Aaron Burr. Like, captivating. I can't look away. He is perfect. He's too elegant. Yes, I can't handle it. It's absolutely amazing. But my favorite character that my heart just like, I can't, is George Washington. I adore, I adore George Washington with my whole heart. I know. I know. It makes me emotional in ways that I can't explain. Yeah. Like, do you feel silly? Like, sometimes I feel kind of stupid talking about it because I'm like, this is a musical. And I'm not even a musical person. Like, I'm not a musical theater person. And it's like I'm talking about the divine. Like, I can't, there's no words. It's like the craziest thing. <laughs> I know. And I'm like, you know what? God looked down at Lin-Manuel and he was like, I'm going to overly gift someone. Yeah. I, pick him. I pick him. He's going to get the lion's share of creativity and innovation. And I'm just sorry to the rest of you. I'm so sorry. I know. I know. Who's your favorite character? This just depends on the week that you're asking me. But like, I love the first half Lafayette, yes. second half Jefferson. Yeah, he's like, fantastic. Like, David is so funny. He's so clever on stage, like his mannerisms and his facial expressions. And, and I love all those boys, those kind of rowdy boys, primarily in the first half. When they're just brothers, like this band of like beer drinking brothers. Something about their relationship to me is very precious. But the truth is I love it all. I'm not embarrassed to tell you that I've learned lyrics and I bought the book. And I, I bought the book. My yes. book came three days ago. I haven't yes. opened it yet because I'm like, this feels like I don't want to just open it casually while I'm making chili. Like this requires an intentional sit down with like a bourbon and a candle lit. Like this is a moment and I haven't had my moment yet. It's just sitting there waiting for me, like just kindly waiting for me. I can't wait. Can't wait to read it. I'm like really excited for you to experience that. Okay. Last thing. Can you just tell everybody where they can find you, where they can find your book? All the things. Yes. Well, everything is the lazy genius something. So if you Google lazy genius, you will find me. But the book is The Lazy Genius Way. The podcast is The Lazy Genius Podcast. I'm on Instagram at The Lazy Genius. And then it's all like in its hub at thelazygeniuscollective.com. Perfect. Run, don't walk, you guys. This is what we need in 2020. Okay, Kendra, yay. 
I so, so enjoyed this hour with you. Thank you so much for saying yes to the show and just being who you are in the world. We need your stuff right now. It's so timely. I know you did not mean to release a book during a pandemic, but turns out it's just what we need right now. So good on you. Thank you. Thank you. It's been an honor. So fun. So fun to be here with you. Same. Thank you. Okay. Pick whatever you want out of that. Just some really easy nuggets to implement in an easy way. Make one choice. Make it once. Batch your kitchen. Whatever. Whatever you want to do here. I think what I'm walking away with is this just through line of asking in every moment, every decision, every crisis, every possibility, what matters to me? That's what I'm walking away with. What matters? Like getting really still, getting really quiet around that question, not letting our emotions like drag us down 14 past like what matters here and how can that drive the car? How can that lead me here? So anyhow, fantastic. If you go to jenhatmaker.com under the podcast tab, we'll have all of Kendra's socials, links to her books, her website, everything. Kind of a one-stop shop for you. That is a fantastic resource that Amanda puts together every single week. If you haven't already, you guys go subscribe to the podcast. Just hit the subscribe tab wherever you listen to your podcasts. It'll show up for you every single week. Thank you for your ratings and your reviews. That's just great for podcasts. And But the main thing is thank you for sharing the podcast. When you post them on your socials, when you send them to your friends and family, like that just means everything to us. And we'll do everything in our power to continue to bring you content that matters to you, that means something to you, that's worth sharing, where we're learning, where we're growing, where we're laughing. Okay? Okay, so on behalf of Laura and Amanda and I, we love you so much. See you next week.